Okay. Good afternoon. I will get it started. And good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our annual uh, Harold Plaus Award lecture today. I'm just absolutely honored and privileged to introduce our esteemed colleague, Associate Professor of Psychology and the Brain Sciences, Daniel Conroy Beam. And uh, we look forward to... <laughs> we, we look forward to his lecture today, the most important decision you will ever make. You know how that is. <laughs> and uh, the Plus uh, Award was established in the year of 1957. And uh, I remember 1958, then we had the first uh, Plus Lecture. And uh, uh, Harold Plus was an assistant professor in economics. This award is one of the most prestigious faculty honors. It is given annually to an outstanding early career professors from the humanities, social sciences, and the natural sciences. Uh, and it recognizes creative achievement and uh, contributions to the intellectual life of our community. And uh, I, uh, uh, I, I remember, uh, who else are the uh, Paul's lectures before, would you wave your hand? You. Welcome, thank you, thank you. And uh, I, I, I remember last time, uh, not last time, some time ago, uh, I delivered this uh, Paul's lecture to uh, Nancy, Nancy Collins, and uh, she at that time had the baby three months old. No, you, she already graduated from the college. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Daniel received his uh, uh, bachelor's degree, B.S. in psychology, and his Ph.D. Individual Differences and in Evolution Psychology at the UT Austin. He joined UC Santa Barbara in 2016. In 2019, uh, Dr. Conroy Beam was awarded a prestigious National Science Foundation Career Award. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 2019 for his groundbreaking research using computer simulations to, to understand mate choices. Uh, and his paper, uh, Assortative Mating and the Evolution of Desirability Co-Variation was awarded the 2020 Marco Wilson Award for Best Paper in Evolution and Human Behavior by the editorial board of the Journal of Evolution and Human Behaviors. He's not only a pioneer researcher in this area, he's also a great mentor and a teacher, including teaching critical statistics courses to our students. So Professor Conroy Beam is outstanding choice for this Pulse Award from his faculty peers, and we are so proud of him uh, to be our speaker today and a recipient. So let me present to you this, this plaque, uh, Harold Pulse Memorial Award to Daniel Conroy Beam in recognition of outstanding performances and creative contributions to the intellectual life of the campus community. There you go. Thank you so much, Chancellor Yang, for that very, very kind introduction. Thank you all for being here. Apparently, I can fill a room. Um, and, and thank you to the, the selection committee for being foolish enough to give me this award. Um, I, I really do know the, the caliber of my, my peers, and so I'm still quite surprised that I'm the one standing here today. But I am, I am really, truly grateful and honored. Um, and I, there's a lot of people I have to thank, but I'll, I'll save that for the end of the talk and, and later. Because um, I'm really excited to talk to you today about the work that we do in my lab on, on what we think is the most important decision that most of you will ever make. Uh, now, uh, you've all been to talks before, so you know how this starts with a desperate plea for validation. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of important problems in the world, and I have just one life to live, so why is it that I should spend my life and your tax dollars studying something like human mate choice? Uh, and I'm, I'm biased, but I think there's lots of good answers to this particular question. I'll share just a couple that I particularly like with you today. Uh, one starts by remembering that we are, at the end of the day, biological organisms, right? So uh, us and everything about us, we are the product of some set of genes interacting with one another. 
and some set of environmental uh, features in just horrifically complex ways to produce us and who we are. Uh, and if and when we produce offspring, these offspring uh, probabilistically inherit copies of those genes that helped to construct us. Right, so the genes that helped to construct me, I inherited them from my parents, they inherited those genes from their parents, who inherited them from their parents, who inherited them from their parents and their parents, all the way back in this unbroken chain of reproduction that extends to the very first spark of life somewhere in this planet, somewhere probably in the ocean. Uh, so all of us, me and you and everyone around, we are just the very edge of this great tapestry of life woven together by this unbreak unbroken thread of reproduction. Right, and mating and mate choice being so close to reproduction has a very powerful role in shaping the form that this tapestry takes. Right? Uh, I'll give you one of my favorite examples of this. Of course, it's a bird, apologies. Uh, but this is a magnificent frigate bird. Uh, I photographed this bird in Belize, although you can see this bird uh, here in Santa Barbara with great effort and great luck. Um, I know it's not the most magnificent looking bird on the planet, but what is really magnificent about them is how they fly. So these are some of the best gliding animals on the planet. Uh, the longest recorded flight of a frigate bird was about two months. So it's two months in the air without ever touching the ground. That is just an unbelievable feat of biological performance. Uh, you can appreciate what makes them so good at flying by comparing them to human engineered flying systems. So here's another image of a frigate bird that gives you a better sense of the shape. Uh, we can compare this to something like a Schleicher ASK-21. This is a human engineered sailplane. Uh, so it's designed to fly like a frigate bird. It doesn't have an engine on board. It just floats on air currents. And we can also compare it to something like an F-22 Raptor, also a human engineered flying system, but designed for a very different kind of flight, right? Very rapid, self-propelled flight. Now, I, I know I'm a psychologist. Uh, I'm not an expert on flight, but people who are tell me if you want to build something that's good at gliding, there's some things you want to give it. Uh, one is you want it to have what's called a high wing aspect ratio. This is a high ratio of the wing span to the wing area. Uh, you can see the Schleicher beats the Raptor on this regard. You also want it to have what's called a low wing loading. This is a ratio of the mass of the craft to the, uh, uh, the wing area. Uh, you can see the Schleicher has a very low wing loading compared to the Raptor. Uh, you can also measure how good something is at gliding with what's called the maximum glide ratio. This is how far the craft can glide forward for every unit of altitude that it loses. Uh, so the Schleicher can go up to 34 meters forward for every meter of altitude that it drops, uh, whereas the Raptor, even though it's a very good flying machine, it's not built for gliding, so it can only go about eight meters forward for every meter of altitude that it drops. So this frigate bird, if you, you know, calculate its design specs, it rivals these human engineered flying systems and then sometimes, in fact, beats them, right? So it has a comparable uh, wing aspect to the Schleicher, it has actually a superior wing loading. It has one of the lowest wing loadings of any animal on the planet, if I recall correctly. And it has a pretty impressive glide ratio of 22. So 22 meters forward for every meter of altitude that it drops, and that's how it manages to stay in the air for months at a time. So if you were to look at this bird and appreciate these design specs, and especially if you didn't understand about evolution, you would be totally forgiven for thinking Right, this bird must have been designed right, by some kind of intelligence for the purpose of gliding. Right? The telos of this thing is soaring in the air. And the world would make sense to you until you saw one of these birds do this, uh, or this, uh, or this. Because in addition to everything I just told you, uh, the males of the species also have this absolutely ridiculous red throat sac, which during the breeding season, they puff up with air and sometimes fly around in this ridiculous display you see here on the screen. Uh, and this would be totally baffling to you, right, from the perspective that the purpose of this bird is to glide, right? Because there's no way in hell this big dumb red balloon is helping the bird glide, right? It is, if anything, anti-aerodynamic. It's also just ostentatiously red in a way that can lead to flight. Uh, we know these things are true because we know there has to be some reason why human engineers don't strap giant red balloons <laughs> to the front of their sailplanes, right? So where does this come from? Why does this otherwise immaculate flying machine have to be burdened with an absolutely ridiculous balloon? Uh, well, of course, it's because, for whatever reason, female frigate birds like this red balloon. Right? Uh, so male frigate birds who have this silly red balloon on their throats are more likely to attract potential mates. They're more likely to produce offspring. And those offspring inherit the genes that gave them that big, dumb red balloon. And this is, you know, a bird, a particularly silly bird, but we're not exempt from these kinds of processes either, right? So we humans are distinguished among primates by our relatively large brain size, especially compared to our body size, right? So we have a much larger brain than you would expect of a primate of our size, and that is 
presumably related to our great intelligence, our cumulative culture, everything we do all the time, everything we're doing right now. Uh, we're also distinguished among at least the great apes uh, in our tendency to form long-term pair bonds, right? Simply put, we get married and chimps do not, right? Uh, and it's long been thought, uh, in fact, people like Mike have written extensively about how this is probably not a coincidence, right? Uh, because uh, pair bonding facilitates biparental care. You have two parents who can care for offspring. And across species, it tends to be the case that having more hands on deck to care for offspring tends to be associated with the evolution of greater brain size, right? So us, uh, we are just a particularly uh, extreme example of this broader trend. Uh, and like the frigate bird, how we manage is very integral to who we are as a species. So that's my pitch from like the perspective of deep biological time, but mating is of course important on more personal time scales as well. Uh, if you think about it for a moment, there is no corner of your everyday life that is unaffected by who you choose as a romantic partner, right? where you live, where you work, how you spend your time, whom you consider friends and family, potentially with whom you start families of your own. Uh, and obviously given mating has its fingers in so many domains of life, uh, it should probably be unsurprising that there is tons of research, some of it done by people here, uh, establishing that uh, the quality of our romantic relationships broadly impacts many aspects of our well-being, right? Higher quality relationships are associated with better physical health, better mental health, better financial success. Uh, so uh, I submit to you, uh, if you want to understand who we are as a species, and also if you want to understand how to improve human well-being, you're going to need to understand something about human mating. So that's my pitch for why, uh, but I'll transition now to what we actually do in my lab, uh, which is asking, well, how? Uh, especially how do we actually choose our mates and, and what does this matter for our long-term relationships? So this has been a surprisingly hard question to answer despite the importance of these questions and despite long-standing interest, uh, in part because it's complicated, right? Uh, each of our mating behaviors individually is the product of some complex set of psychology which we uh, have surprisingly little understanding of. Uh, but then it's also made worse because each of our behaviors take place in the context of large dynamic social contexts, right? Where any one person's decisions in the mating domain in, in principle affect the decisions that are available to everyone else, right? And studying these kinds of complex systems, making predictions about behavior in these kinds of complex systems is really, really hard. Uh, so that's why my lab makes pretty heavy use uh, of a technique called agent-based modeling. Uh, in a nutshell, this is a computer simulation technique where what you do is inside a computer, you simulate populations of autonomous agents, little simulated people. Uh, these little simulated people act and interact with one another according to pre-programmed decision rules, which we control. Uh, then we derive predictions uh, about the real world by observing the behavior of these simulated systems. And then we test those predictions by comparing that behavior to what goes on in the real world. Uh, my lab especially does this in the context of a modeling framework that we developed uh, which we call couple simulation. Uh, the way that this works is we go out into the real world and recruit samples of people who've made real mating decisions that we would like to explain. So for example, we could recruit people like myself and my wife. We measure things about these people uh, that we think might have been important to those choices. So for example, we can measure each person's preferences. That is, what do you want your partner to be like ideally? That is, you know, how kind should they be? How funny should they be? How smart should they be? Et cetera, et cetera. We can also measure the corresponding traits. So how kind are you actually? How smart are you actually? Et cetera, et cetera. And then once we have that data, what we can do is basically avatar these people. By the way, thank you to James Cameron for making this reference relevant again. Um, we can avatar these people. That is, we can create little simulated copies of them that inherit their preferences and traits. Right? So there'll be a little simulated Dan in my computer with all of my preferences and all of my traits, a little simulated Jalon with all of her preferences and her traits as well. And if we can do this for enough people, we can do some fun things. Uh, one, we can see, well, who's actually paired with whom in the real world? That is, what are the actual mating decisions that we're trying to explain? But then because these are simulated people and we control everything about their reality, we can force them to do whatever we want. So one thing we can do is we can force them all to break up, throw them into a simulated mating market, and force them to choose partners again, this time using decision algorithms that we control experimentally. And then we can see how good are these simulated mating markets at getting these little avatars back with the correct partner. Right, so in this case, this, part, this market got A back with A, but it mixed up B and C, so we would say this market has a 33% simulation accuracy. And the intuition here is, if we happened to understand everything that was actually important about real world mate choice, and if we happened to model it accurately inside these little simulated mating markets, then these avatars should tend to make the same decisions as did their real world counterparts, and so they should tend to choose the same partners again. So the more and more accurate we can make these simulated mating markets, the more and more confident we are that we're getting close to how mate choice actually happens. 
This is a very, the ethos here is a very Feynman-esque, right? If we understand how matroid happens, we should be able to rebuild it in a computer. Now, in order to do all of that, we have to be able to endow each of these little avatars with several things. Uh, one thing they need uh, is some set of preferences, uh, by which I mean uh, people differ from one another in innumerable dimensions, right? Uh, some people are kinder, some people are crueler, some people are taller, some people are shorter, some people have particularly wrinkly elbows, and some people have relatively smooth elbows. <laughs> right? There's literally no end to the number of ways in which you could compare different people to one another in principle, but we are finite beings, and we have to make a finite set of comparisons eventually. Right? So the robots need to know what dimensions actually matter for mate choice, right? what things are worth evaluating. They need to know kindness matters more in picking a mate than does elbow smoothness. And they also need to know, within those dimensions, what values should you actually prefer, right? Kind partners are better than cruel partners. Uh, this one's kind of easy to solve. Fortunately, there's decades of research on mate preferences, so we pretty much know what most people want in a partner. We pretty much know how to measure those relatively well. So like I said, we kind of just get these right out of the participants. That's easy. But that solves a problem, but it also creates another problem, uh, which is people have lots of preferences, right? Uh, so ask anybody what they want, ideally in a long-term partner, and they'll start talking, and they won't stop talking until you stop them from talking, right? <laughs> um, people want partners who are kind and smart and funny and healthy and wealthy and attractive and blah, 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 blah. Um, that's true. What's also true is, you, we all know, you never find somebody who just has all those things, right? Uh, every partner you find is going to meet some of your preferences. They're going to fall short of others. Uh, and so in order to make decisions among these imperfect options, we need some way to boil all of our individual preferences down into some sort of overall value judgment. To say, you know, you have these things that I want, you don't have these things that I want. Overall, you're an eight for me. Overall, you're a five for me. Overall, you're a two for me. We call this mate value, and the robots need to be able to make these mate value judgments. And then last but not least, once you have those value judgments, what the robots need is some set of mate choice algorithms. By which I mean some set of decision rules that dictate who you pursue based on those value judgments, uh, and maybe more importantly, what you do when the person you pursue inevitably doesn't pursue you back. Right? Uh, and there are lots of different algorithms that uh, we could test uh, that could describe human mate choice in principle. So my lab has done work on all of these things, but it's a short talk today, uh, so I'm going to focus just on the mate choice algorithms, because honestly, I think they're the most fun. Uh, so we'll start with that. Let's talk a little bit about these mate choice algorithms. Uh, I'm going to also, for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on two that are relatively good and relatively easy to explain. Uh, the first you might have heard of before. It's called the Gale-Shapley algorithm. Uh, this is uh, not actually a mate choice model. Um, it's a weird one to start with, uh, but we're borrowing this from economics. Uh, this was uh, developed as a solution to the so-called stable marriage problem, uh, which is really any time you need to pair elements from two different sets, but those elements have some set of preferences that dictate how they would like to be paired. Uh, so this was originally designed for circumstances where you have, for example, high school applicants who would like to be admitted to universities. Uh, the applicants vary in their qualifications, right? Universities would prefer to admit more qualified students. Uh, but the universities also vary in their quality. Students would like to go to higher quality universities. <laughs> I don't, why are you guys laughing? Uh, um, so how do you decide which students get paired with which university? Right? Uh, so the way this works, this is you know, not a mate choice model, but it was motivated with a pretty crude analogy to mate choice, so we're going to use it as a mate choice model. Uh, the way this works is uh, basically one of these sets is somewhat arbitrarily designated as being males, uh, the other as being females. And at each step of the model, uh, each unpreferred male just approaches his most preferred female who has not yet rejected him. If she happens to be single, then she temporarily uh, pairs with him. Then you move on to the next unpaired male. He approaches his most preferred female who's not yet rejected him. Uh, if she happens to be in a relationship already, then what she does is she compares her options. Uh, if she prefers the partner she's already with, then she rejects the suitor. Uh, but if she prefers the suitor, she breaks up with her current partner and starts a temporary relationship with the new guy. And you just repeat these steps over and over again until everybody has found a partner. Uh, now, there are several nice things about this model. It is algorithmic in that it's a set of steps that you could write down on a sheet of paper, and if faithfully executed, would move a population of single people into being a population of mated people. Uh, everybody's guaranteed to find a partner, assuming equal sex ratio. 
Uh, and also the pairs are guaranteed to be what's called stable. Uh, that is, uh, nobody would prefer to be with a different partner who'd also prefer to be with them in return. These are all nice mathematical features, uh, although not necessarily plausible descriptions of how human mating actually happens. Um, there's lots of you know, oddities here. One you might have picked up on is that it's inherently asymmetric, right? It acquires, it's also inherently heteronormative, right? It requires that there are males who pursue and that there are females who choose, uh, which is you know, maybe a good description of a lot of non-human mate choice, maybe a good description of American mate choice in the 50s, uh, but probably not a good, good description of mate, human mate choice in general. Uh, so some pros here and some cons. Uh, so we can move on to a different model, just for the sake of comparison, uh, called the resource allocation model. Uh, this is a model we actually developed in my lab. Uh, the way this one works is it starts by recognizing that we all have a limited set of resources that we can dedicate to pursuing partners, right? There's only so many nights in a week that you could go out on dates. There's only so much money in your wallet that you can spend on those dates. Uh, there's only so much energy that you can dedicate to this process rather than all the other things you have to do. Uh, and you have you know, some set of partners to whom you could dedicate those mate pursuit resources. Right? Uh, and the fact that these resources are finite imposes trade-offs. Right? So every additional hour that I spend courting John Burden Sanderson is an hour that I have to take away from someone else like Ronald. Right? And so you can think of mate choice as being a decision of how do I allocate these limited resources across the options that I have. Uh, this is a mixed audience, so I'll spare you the boring details of exactly how this works. But in a nutshell, uh, this model is a reciprocity model. Uh, so basically, the agents, the simulated agents, are given a fixed pool of resources that they allocate to pursuing their partners. Uh, they initially invest those resources in partners just directly in proportion to value. So more appealing options get more of my time, less appealing options get less of my time. But then they iteratively reallocate those resources based on reciprocal interest. So if you showed more interest in me yesterday, I'll give you a little bit more of my time today. If you showed less interest in me yesterday, I'll give you a little less of my time today. And you just uh, continually nudge your investments like that over and over again uh, until you found a partner. Uh, so to show you how this works, this projector is not doing great faith to this, uh, this graphic, but uh, this is a social network representation of this model playing out. Uh, so each node here is a, one of those little avatar agents that's based on a real participant in one of our studies. Their actual partner is somewhere else in the network. Uh, the little blue ties connecting them represent how much of their limited resources are they investing in those other partners. Uh, so you can see initially everybody's kind of just investing a little bit in everybody. And then you kick off that series of uh, uh, reciprocal investments. And what you'll see is some of these ties gradually get thicker as people realize that they have mutual interest with one another. Others gradually get thinner and prune away until uh, eventually everybody has found one or sometimes two uh, partners with whom they have a relatively strong mutual interest. So these uh, pairings on the right where they've pooled all their resources on one another, these represent the predicted pairings out of this model. So we can compare these to the relationships that these people are actually in to see how accurate was this model in reproducing these relationships. Okay, so there's two example models. Each of them maybe has some features that strike you as plausible, other features that strike you as implausible. But we can ask ourselves, well, can we use this simulation approach that I've described to determine well, which one is more plausible overall? Which one, in general, does a, a better description of describing how people tend to choose their partners? <coughs> So we've done this a lot, um, but I'll show you, just because it has sentimental value for me, uh, I'll show you the first set of data that we tried this approach on. Uh, so this was a sample of about 400 people who were members of about 200 heterosexual romantic dyads recruited using Qualtrics' survey panel service, about 50 years old, in the relationship for about 12 years. Uh, each person reported to us their ideal preferences and a long-term romantic partner using a 20-item questionnaire. They're the first 20 things you would think of if you thought of what you want in an ideal romantic partner, kindness, intelligence, attractiveness, health, et cetera, et cetera. They reported this by rating on seven point bipolar adjective scales, which basically means they said, you know, one, if I want my partner to be very unkind, nobody said that, uh, to seven, if I want my partner to be very kind. Uh, they also rated themselves on each of these dimensions using the same scale, and they rated their partner, and so we can average those together to get a measure of what each person's actually like. Um, I went into more detail on this than I planned to, but uh, basically all of the data I'm gonna show you today is pretty much exactly like this. Sample size is gonna bounce around. We've improved measurement a little bit over time, but this is the general flavor of all the data you're gonna see, so just remember this uh, for the future studies. 
So we use these data to create these little avatar agents for each of our participants. We run those little avatar agents through different simulated mating markets. Uh, in this case, one in which mate choice is based on, or one in which mate choice is random, uh, another in which mate choice is based on the Gale Shapley algorithm, and a third in which mate choice is based on that resource allocation model. Uh, and then we can see how good was each of these models at reconstructing the relationship that the participants, uh, uh, the couples that we originally sampled. So here's uh, a graph of that key result. Uh, going across the X here are those different models. Going up the Y is the simulation accuracy, so the percent of those couples that we uh, successfully reproduced. Uh, first things first, we see random does terrible. Uh, in this case, uh, reproducing on average just about 2.5% of the couples that we sampled. Uh, that should not be surprising, right? If you put 200 married couples in a gymnasium, scrambled them up into random pairs, only about 2.5% of those pairs would actually be married to one another. Uh, that makes sense, but it's a good sanity check and it also gives us a good baseline against which to compare the other models. So how do they do? Do they beat random? Yeah. Uh, so here's the result of the Gale Shapley algorithm. The Gale Shapley algorithm in this particular sample accurately reproduced about 36% of the couples that we sampled, which to kind of like set the bar here, <laughs> I mean, this is the very first time we tried this approach at all. And I thought like this is a total moonshot, right? There's no way this is actually gonna work. You know, I'm gonna be very happy if the best model cracks like 25% of the couples because it's such a ridiculous idea. So to open the data and see like Gail Shapley is hitting 36%, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is fantastic. I am so happy. This is the best, <laughs> the most successful project I've ever done. Um, uh, and I was even more happy to find out that that's not even the best we were gonna do. So the resource allocation model in this case successfully reproduced about 48% of the couples that we sampled. Uh, so Yes, we can use this couple simulation approach to compare among different models. Uh, they do actually, what I thought at the time was surprisingly well, uh, and in general, the resource allocation model seems to be uh, pulling ahead, at least of the Gale Shapley algorithm. Uh, now, I showed you just two models today because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, if you want to read the actual paper, which is barely visible there, uh, oh, these are significantly different, sorry. Um, if you want to read the actual paper, we also looked at two other models that came from the prior literature. Um, they did worse than Gale Shapley, so I just didn't talk about them here. Um, and there are other models we're working on. I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, but, you know, yes, couple simulation does discriminate among the different models, and it looks like the resource allocation model uh, is doing relatively well, at least among the ones we've compared so far. Uh, now, I will say, I, I was very happy with 48%, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, but 48% right still means we're getting 52% wrong. Uh, and so it's a pretty reasonable question to ask, well, is there anything interestingly different about the 52% we're getting wrong versus the 48% we're getting right? Uh, I believe it was actually Shelley, uh, when an early time I presented these data, she, the way she put it, I really liked it, was, is the model wrong or are the people wrong? Um, <laughs> so to that point, uh, I'm very lucky that just by chance in this same sample, we happened to include a battery of different relationship quality measures uh, for no particular reason. Uh, so going across the X, these are all these relationship quality measures, which would be familiar to any relationships researcher. Uh, going up the Y is just the score on those measures uh, in a percentage of maximum possible metric. Uh, the blue boxes I'm about to show you, these are the people whose relationships were accurately reproduced by that resource allocation model. So these are the 48%. Uh, the red bars are the 52%. They're the ones that the resource allocation model is getting wrong. Uh, basically, what we see is the people that we get right with this couple simulation approach, they just have happier relationships across the board, right? So they're more committed according to two, or excuse me, they're more satisfied according to two different standardized measures of relationship satisfaction. They're more committed to their relationships, they're more invested in their relationships and they report stronger feelings of romantic love. They're also less jealous, uh, less avoidantly attached, less anxiously attached. They just have better relationships. Um, and this was uh, very surprising to me at the time. Uh, it's still surprising to me. Uh, because these models weren't designed to do this. They weren't designed to predict relationship quality. We were just trying to reconstruct the relationships as they existed. As I showed you, they don't directly make use of any relationship quality information to make their predictions. And I, I didn't know at the time, I still don't know to this day exactly what they're picking up on that is giving them this predictive power, but this is a very robust result. We've replicated it across multiple samples in our lab. All, every time we do this, the couples that we, we uh, successfully reproduce with this couple simulation approach, we just have happier relationships across a, a wide range of dimensions. So that's a nice bonus, I guess. So as an interim summary, 
right? Uh, yes, we can use this, this approach to compare among different models of mate choice. It seems so far this resource allocation model that we developed is doing relatively well, at least compared to some of the other models from the prior literature. Uh, and this couple simulation approach has this peculiar power to predict relationship satisfaction and other dimensions of quality, which we still to this day don't quite understand. So if you've got any ideas, uh, let me know later. So, okay, that's, that's comparing mate choice algorithms. Uh, like I've said, we've done a lot of other work, but we don't have that much time. Um, so uh, I'm happy to talk about that later. Uh, that said, I do wanna talk about uh, two other projects that I just think are particularly fun. Um, that kind of show off uh, the versatility of this approach. Uh, one is uh, using this general simulation approach uh, across different cultures, and another is uh, doing this across time. So the data I just showed you is from the US. Most of the data we collect is from the US, uh, but if you know me, you know I'm particularly fond of cross-cultural research, and you know, for good reason, I think, that the US uh, is important to us, but it is just one cultural context. Um, and it is, you know, the way that we mate in the US is not necessarily representative of human mating uh, all over the place or all, all across time. Uh, and so it's very good to test our models in as many different places as we can. And so that's why I'm, I'm really, really fortunate uh, to have these data that I'll talk about now. Uh, so what I'm about to talk about, uh, this project I owe entirely uh, to this man you see standing here, John Patton. Uh, John uh, was an anthropologist at Cal State Fullerton. He's standing here with his wife and research partner, Brenda Bowser, uh, and the research team that collected these data uh, I'm about to show you. Uh, John and Brenda were also coincidentally both UCSD alums. Um, John, uh, I should say John, uh, recently very tragically passed away, um, and that is uh, a, a huge loss. John was just a, a fantastic scholar, a very generous person, a true friend. Um, and this project is a testament to all of that um, because, the, the, I mean, the way this came about is I gave a talk very similar to this at Cal State Fullerton, and John came up to me afterwards and he's like, oh, that's cool stuff. I literally just collected exactly the data that you need. Uh, why don't you just take it and have some fun? Uh, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> thank you, John. Um, so John, John was an anthropologist. He did uh, most of his work uh, in a village called Kanambo in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, here's a, 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 I mean, seriously, John did everything. Here's a drone video of Kanambo from the last time uh, he was there in the field. Uh, Kanambo is a small village, about 200-ish uh, adults and children who were members of about 30-ish uh, households, uh, divided into two political factions, which roughly correspond to the two local ethnic groups, the Achuar and the Sapara. Um, they are, in John's words, uh, self-sufficient uh, forager horticulturalists, meaning they, they grow and uh, hunt all the food that they eat. Uh, marriage in Kanambo, usefully for me, is relatively monogamous. There was one polygynous marriage, I think, in the village at the time John did this work. Um, and it's also matrilocal, meaning men marry into the village from other nearby villages. Uh, the reason why I'm so excited about this data, though, is that Kanambo is relatively isolated. So there are no roads that lead into Kanambo. Uh, there's no access to wa by water for both geographic and political reasons. The only way in from you know, our weird industrialized world is on this very dodgy looking airstrip you see here uh, in the video. And so this is kind of like an ideal context for a person like me who wants to model mating markets because there's not like mass immigration <laughs> in or out of Kanambo, right? And everybody, because it's a small village, everybody knows everybody, right? So everybody knows the complete mating market. We can sample a relatively large percentage of the complete mating market. And so we can do some really interesting modeling that we can't do in the US. So fortunately, again, I had nothing to do with this. Uh, this is John's genius. Uh, the last time he was there, uh, he had as many people as he could in the village participate in this photo ranking task, taking advantage of the fact that everybody knows everybody. So if you're a participant in the study, you sit down, John shows you two random Polaroid photos of two opposite sex village members and just asks you a question about them. In, in our case, who is the better spouse, either in Spanish or one of the two local languages? And you just take those Polaroids, you place them down on the table, you put the better spouse above the worst spouse. And then he shows you a third random Polaroid out of the deck, and he says, put them on the table where you think they belong. You know, maybe you think they're worse than the two you were already given. And he just does this one at a time with different Polaroids of different village members until basically everybody has put together their own custom tier list of how good of a spouse everyone else in the village is from their perspective. Beautiful data. <laughs> um, John converted these into numeric scores by assigning uh, each photo in the top tier a one, each photo in the bottom tier a zero, 
and then intermediate scores for intermediate tiers. I know that's not perfect, but like, come on, it's great otherwise. Um, so these are basically our mate value measures for all the people in Konambo from the perspective of all the people in Konambo. Um, we can use that to build avatar agents for this village, and we can do that sort of simulation modeling that we've done in the US in this very different cultural context. Just for comparison, we can compare this to some other US data. Same general flavor, just a bigger sample now, and we've, we've cleaned up our measurement just a little bit. Uh, so here's the, the, the key result, for now at least. Uh, on the left is data from the US, on the right is data from, from John, from Konambo. Um, uh, same setup as before, so the y-axis is simulation accuracy, what percentage of these couples are we successfully reproducing with these different mate choice models. Uh, on the x-axis are the different mate choice models. Uh, so on the left we can just see, can we replicate those results that we found in the US before? The answer is yeah. Uh, so overall accuracy numbers are lower in this sample than the sample I showed you before, but that's just because it's a bigger sample. It's harder to guess who's paired with whom if you have more wrong answers that you can make. Uh, so overall accuracy does go down a bit, but the rank ordering is still exactly the same. Resource allocation model coming up first, random coming up last, uh, Gail Shapley and the others in the middle, uh, and resource allocation model is significantly outcompeting Gail Shapley in this case. So yeah, these things replicate very well within the US. Uh, but can we also replicate them in this very different cultural context, this very different mating market? Um, the answer is pretty much yeah. <laughs> Uh, so error bar is much wider now because Kanambo is a small place. We're necessarily working with a small sample. I, I guess it's still a sample. Um, but the results are pretty similar, right? Random still does terribly, of course. Uh, the resource allocation model is still coming out as the best, in this case reproducing uh, numerically the best. In this case still producing 50% uh, uh, of the marriages in Kanambo. Uh, we do see a slight rank order change. This aspiration threshold, that's the ATM, uh, is now outcompeting the Gale Shapley algorithm. Eh, that maybe means something interesting, and I have some speculations about maybe what's going on there, but it also just could be sampling error because it's a tiny sample. Uh, but in general, uh, uh, the rank ordering is, is preserved uh, with the exception of that one minor flip. Uh, so basically, yeah, we can take this approach and these models which were developed for you know, large scale, industrialized, very weird mating markets uh, and still apply them to successfully reproduce mate choices even in this small scale, isolated, community with a, with a uh, fairly different uh, uh, mating market. Uh, I, I will say I showed these data to John um, and he said, uh, that's great, uh, but did you remember to account for the fact that there are no cross-coalition marriages? Uh, remember I told you there are these two political factions that correspond to ethnic groups. Apparently it's, it's very uh, taboo to marry outside of the coalition that usually triggers a coalition change. John didn't tell me that uh, before I did the analyses. This is why it's good to talk to your anthropologist who has uh, ethnographic knowledge. Um, so I was like, okay, well, uh, thanks, I guess. Uh, so I went back and I redid these uh, models, including a constraint that prohibited cross-coalition matching. Uh, and when you do that, you do see, in fact, accuracy does go up a little bit. In this case, uh, the resource allocation model now is successfully reproducing about 62% of the marriages in Kanambo. Uh, so this, um, I just, I just, I don't know, this is so fun for me. <laughs> I've never gotten to work with, with data like this before, uh, and it's so exciting that this approach uh, extends so well, even despite uh, uh, these, these large differences in our two study sites. Um, yeah, so that's, that's couple simulation across contexts. Um, I'll, I'll now briefly talk about uh, couple simulation across time. This is something I should not be talking about because uh, this is brand new data. Uh, we just finished collecting it and I have not finished thinking it through, uh, but I'm just really excited about this and I want to show you some of the, the kind of key preliminary results at least. Uh, so this is, a, this is a longitudinal study, it's been a long time in the works, uh, where we collected a sample of US dyads uh, at two time points separated by a little over a year. Um, and we had three major questions, there were three big reasons why we wanted to do this. Uh, one, we wanted to see you know, how stable is this simulation accuracy result, right? That is, if I reproduce your relationship today, does that mean I'm still likely to reproduce your relationship in the future, or is this really just a function of how you're feeling about your partner in the moment? Is this an enduring feature of your relationship, or is this a fleeting fancy? We also wanted to know, you know, given that couple simulation can predict relationship quality, we wanted to know, well, does this actually extend into the future, right? Again, is this just predicting how you're feeling about your relationship today, or does this tell me something about how your relationship is going to progress into the future? And, and kind of on that point, we wanted to know uh, if, if this relationship quality result is robust, 
uh, can we use this uh, couple simulation result to predict any more serious objective relationship outcomes, the actual progression of your relationship over time. Uh, so here, this is a, a longitudinal sample. It's actually the same US sample I showed you just a moment ago. Um, we just now have the second wave that we could compare. Uh, so, you know, about 1,700 people, uh, about 850 heterosexual romantic dyads. They reported their preferences and traits and a bunch of other things at time one. Uh, and then we brought them back uh, no less than a year later uh, and had them complete basically all the same measures again. Um, we got 408 people, so about 204 uh, relationships uh, on that, that second wave. Uh, and so here's just you know, some key preliminaries. Again, still chewing on a lot of this, uh, but just speaking to those, so those three major questions we had. Uh, so on the left here, uh, this is looking at how stable is couple simulation accuracy over time. Uh, so on the X is whether or not we accurately reproduced your relationship a year ago. The Y is whether we accurately reproduce your relationship today. Uh, basically what we see is if we accurately reproduce your relationship a year ago, uh, of those people, uh, we act, wow, I, I botched that. Uh, <laughs> for 70% of the people we accurately reproduced a year ago, we still accurately reproduce their relationships today. Only about 30% switch from accurate to inaccurate over the course of a year. Uh, conversely, if we inaccurately reproduce a relationship a year ago, uh, of those, about 60% are still inaccurate today, and about 40% switch from being inaccurate to, to accurate. So the inaccurate classification does seem to be a little bit less stable, but in general, this is pretty stable, especially by psychological standards, right? Uh, uh, so 65% of couples retain the same classification over the span of a year, right? So there's if if we reproduce you accurately today, or however we reproduce you today, that we can uh, say we have a roughly 65% chance of reproducing the same way, even up, you know, more than one year in the future. So this is a fairly stable classification. This is not really just about how you're feeling about your partner in the moment. So in light of that, does this also predict uh, important aspects of relationship quality moving into the future? So that's this middle graph. So going up the y-axis is relationship satisfaction. Higher means you're happier, lower means you're less happy. Uh, on the x-axis is uh, uh, whether or not we reproduced your relationship in our resource allocation model a year ago. Uh, and basically, we do see that uh, essentially, if I accurately reproduce your relationship with my model today, you are significantly more likely to be happy with your relationship even over one year from now. Uh, so the simulation accuracy is not just predicting how you feel about your partner in the moment, it's predicting how you're going to feel about your partner even over one year into the future. And in fact, uh, how you feel now is a better predictor of your future happiness than is uh, whether or not we predict you in the future, right? So this is a really, I don't know exactly why that is, but this is a really strong, uh, really robust uh, uh, perspective predictor of relationship quality. So that's nice. And then last but not least, in terms of you know, actual relationship outcomes, uh, you know, unfortunately or unfortunately, these are relatively happy couples, so not that many bad things happen to them. Uh, most of these people were still together, uh, which is good for them, but kind of annoying for me. Um, uh, but we did have a, a small amount of infidelity that people admitted to, so we can look at things like that. Uh, well, I really struggled with how to represent this for today, so we'll try this. Uh, so here on the x-axis is basically whether or not uh, couples experience infidelity in the year between our two time points. So uh, either no one cheated or one or the other partner cheated on the other. Going up the y-axis here, this is uh, how invested your avatar was in your actual partner when we modeled you a year ago, right? Uh, so was your little avatar really interested in your partner? Uh, that's going to be high up here. Or, or if your avatar was really interested in someone else, then you're going to be down here. Uh, and basically what we see is uh, for the people who cheated or got cheated on, their avatars a year ago were less interested in their actual partner uh, compared to people who did not have any experience of infidelity. Uh, so this is you know, not exactly the slam dunk we can predict divorce I was hoping for, uh, but we are seeing some, uh, some suggestive evidence that we can use some metrics out of this couple simulation approach to predict actual meaningful outcomes in people's long-term romantic relationships. So just to put that another way, this couple simulation accuracy metric, which we were developing, is relatively stable over time. It's capturing enduring features of people's relationships. It prospectively predicts the quality of those relationships into the future. It tells me, you know, if I can reproduce you today, it tells me you're more likely to be happy even a year from now. Uh, and it does seem to prospectively predict some of these more important uh, relationship outcomes, relationship events like infidelity. Okay, so 
that's a lot. It's basically about mate choice algorithms. Um, but uh, we've been using this approach for lots of different things in my lab, right? Uh, basically, you know, that first study w was uh, compared to our expectations of smashing success. Uh, so we're kind of feeling like we have a hammer and everything in mating is starting to look like a nail. Uh, and so we've been applying this to lots of different questions uh, throughout the mating process. Uh, so for example, uh, I have a paper I'm working on, I promise, um, that's adapting reinforcement learning models as models of how people search their mating market. So how do you come to know what options are even available to you? Uh, the paper just came out uh, not that long ago uh, using couple simulation to compare different models of that integration process. So how do you actually make those value judgments across your options? Uh, I was just talking yesterday with my student Carlos who's putting together some very nice models of how people learn to adjust their preferences over time based on their experiences on the mating market. Uh, that same paper I mentioned before was also looking at, uh, you know, what is the actual data structure that preferences are stored in, in the mind. Um, have a more recent project looking at, you know, what is the most appropriate level of analysis to, to think about mating? Like, uh, if I want to predict your behavior, do I really need to know your individual preferences or can I get by just knowing what people like in general? Uh, and then my student Katie Walter, her dissertation is doing some very nice modeling looking at uh, relationship disqualifiers, right? Things that rule people out as potential partners uh, or, or not. So for each of these you know, stages of the mate choice process, we can articulate different models of how mate choice might happen, either based on the prior literature or based on theoretical analysis. And then we can use this couple simulation approach to tell us which of these models is relatively plausible. Right, so by doing this work, we are, uh, oh, uh, we can also, as I showed you, uh, do this work across cultures uh, and across time. Right. Uh, so by doing this work, we are slowly piecing together a, a detailed map uh, of how mate choice actually happens in the mind that is much higher in resolution than uh, that much of the prior literature has been able to put together. Uh, and we're, you know, very excited about this and very proud of the work that we've done so far. Uh, but there's also, we know, a lot more work to do and we have a lot more planned for the future. And in particular, if you'll indulge me just one minute longer, um, I do want to talk just a little bit more about this couple simulation across time idea, because uh, this is a future direction that I'm pretty excited about. I think most of my lab is pretty excited about. Um, so, you know, the way I explained this whole couple simulation approach to you earlier was we take people who are already together and we try to recapitulate those relationships inside a simulation. We can do that, right? Um, and that's, you know, useful, there's a reason we started there, uh, there's some advantages to doing that, but there's some big disadvantages too. Uh, and we don't have to just do this. Uh, in fact, we could, in principle, for example, recruit samples of single people who are interested in being relationships but are not yet. We can measure things about them, about the kinds of relationships they would like to be in. We can use that to build avatar agents for these single people. We can run their avatars through simulated mating markets based on whatever models we are interested in. And then we can make recommendations to these people, right? We can say this model, which is good at finding, identifying relationships that are happy and stable, uh, 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 minimally eventful over long periods of time. Um, this model says that you might like to be with this person. Why don't you go on a date and tell us how it goes, right? Um, and this is not just theoretical. Uh, we very much want to do this study. Uh, we're, uh, in the early planning stages for trying to get a pilot of this off the ground next year, where, you know, if all goes well, what we would love to do is recruit single UCSB students who want to be in relationships. We can measure things about them. Uh, we can measure collect mate choice data from them, like what we get from the people who are already in relationships. We can build them avatar agents. We can run their avatars through simulated mating markets built on things, for example, like this resource allocation model. And then we can introduce the students to their avatars matches, right? We can say, our model says you might like each other. Why don't you go on a date and tell us how it goes? <laughs> right? uh, and we can use this to compare different models on their ability to establish initial attraction, right? What models put, pe put people together that actually like each other? What models put people together that actually establish successful long-term relationships? And especially, what models help people form high-quality relationships that are supportive of their happiness and their well-being? And I, you know, I think, I suspect, there might be a lot of interest in this among our students, right? If you don't know our students, you can spend just a little bit of time, as I often do, perusing the UCSB subreddit. Uh, and <laughs> when our students are not complaining about us, uh, they're spending a lot of time complaining about their love lives, right? They're using things like Tinder and Bumble and, uh, and the Marriage Project, and they're not having a good time. Uh, they're having a hard time establishing, finding good partners, establishing relationships. 
uh, that make them happy. And many of our students are, are quite unhappy, right? They're very lonely. Um, they feel quite bad about themselves. They're really desperate to have, uh, to get some help uh, establishing meaningful social relationships on this campus. This makes them very unhappy. It makes them not perform well in class. It makes them not want to be here, right? So this is a serious issue that is of great importance to many of our students, right? So if this pilot is successful, and I think we have lots of data suggesting it is likely to be, Right, then we can hopefully, this is you know, pipe dream Dan talking now, but we can hopefully scale this up. Right? We can build uh, a campus-wide, student-focused you know, research matchmaking system to help our students find good relationships on campus. And this will be good for science, right? this will be good for the many people on this campus uh, who are interested in the science, interested in the psychology of relationships. This will be you know, a really unique, uh, you know, high-throughput uh, data pipeline for getting really interesting data about relationship formation. It'd be a great training opportunity for our students, right, to get to work on applied science in a relationship domain, to get to be able to build these kinds of models, which is, you know, very lucrative these days. <laughs> and it's also it would be very good for the well-being of our students, right? They are desperate to have meaningful, happy relationships. Uh, so if we can help them form those relationships, that'll be good for their happiness, it'll be good for their health, it'll be good for their performance in class. Uh, and so we think there's a lot of promise here. We're very hopeful, uh, we're very excited to get started doing this work. So check with me in like a year. Uh, and we'll see if this all blew up in my face. Um, so I've been talking for a really long time. Um, so uh, I just want to thank lots of people. Uh, there's way, way too many people I need to thank right now. So I'm apologizing in advance for the people I definitely forget to thank. Uh, but I, I, you know, I first want to thank my fantastic students uh, who I've been so fortunate to work with uh, over the time that I've been here, uh, both graduate students and undergraduate students, um, who one, have done a lot of the labor <laughs> behind what I'm showing you today. Uh, but also just have taught me so much uh, and have been one of the best parts of my career. Uh, I have so many fantastic uh, friends and, and colleagues. Um, I've always said, you know, the very best part of being at UCSD is getting to be part of this amazing intellectual community. Um, you've all uh, made my career possible. You've all made me better scientists, and I'm, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to know all of you. Um, I also have many uh, uh, colleagues and peers at other institutions uh, who have been uh, very important uh, to, to uh, my development as a scientist. Um, I also can't give a talk about my choice and not thank my wife, who's here today, um, who's uh, been so incredibly supportive and so way too tolerant of the ridiculous lifestyle that it takes uh, to have this kind of career. Um, so yeah, also, you know, thank NSF for giving me the money to do this. Uh, and thank all of you for your attention and for being here today. Uh, I'd love to take some of your questions. This uh, inspiring talk, and as he said, he's uh, ready to take some questions. And I have a microphone, so if you have a question, by all means, raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone over to you. Thank you uh, so much for this really interesting talk. Um, have you considered modeling non-romantic relationships? <laughs> um, uh, so friendship has? matches. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I was just talking with a friend of mine who is a friendship researcher. Um, you know, I've done, we have one paper together. Uh, my friend, I'll shout out Jamie. Hey, Jamie. Um, my friend Jamie Krems, she's very interested in friendship. We have one paper kind of applying some of these basic models to friendship. Um, and they, they do kind of transport a little bit with some interesting differences. So yeah, we've, we've long talked about like, I mean, this matchmaking system, there's no reason it has to be romantic relationships. I just personally am interested in romantic relationships, but yeah, like we could do the same thing to help find a friend, right? We could apply a lot of the same models, you know, probably with some slight differences, but we could apply a lot of the same models to the same sort of thing. And yeah, we'd have a lot of the same positive benefits. So yeah, uh, Jamie and I <laughs> uh, are very interested in doing that. Um, and that, that's probably in the not too distant future too. That's yeah, a great, great question. Uh, thanks a lot, Dan. That was marvelous to see all that laid out. Um, I feel like you just got here like last week. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm I don't know if it was true at all your models, but like kind of having equal numbers, you mm -hmm. know, on both sides. And of course, I hear lots of complaints from UCSB students given, you know, bias sex ratios, uh, particularly in certain majors and, and whatnot. Uh, and so I'm just wondering with the kind of dynamics that that creates with differential bargaining power and 
shifting of preferences and, yeah. and whatnot, like how that maybe plays out in, in terms of your kind of modeling context and whatnot? No, uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, so yeah, all of the models, because we're working with already formed couples, right? They already sort of have a built-in equal sex ratio. Um, you know, models like, none of the models necessarily assume that though. I mean, at the end of the day, if you have heterosexual samples and you have a biased sex ratio, somebody's gotta be unhappy, somebody's gotta make some kind of compromise. Um, but none of the models actually assume that you have an equal sex ratio. We can still make pairs based on that. Um, it's just, yeah, an unfortunate reality that somebody's gotta be left out of the market. Um, in terms of how that affects the sort of the dynamics of the market though, I mean, so Katie has a, a nice paper uh, using so a large scale cross-cultural sample looking at how sex ratio across, cult uh, across countries does indeed relate to the sex ratio of those countries. So yeah, basically the sex that is more scarce has more bargaining power and they use it, right? Uh, they set higher standards. Um, so that you know probably is playing out on campus, but you know we sort of take, like I said, we sort of take the preferences for granted, right? Like, I mean, Carlos is interested in where the preferences come from, and so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in, in his models. Uh, but at least for like making these pairings, making these recommendations, you know, our approach is come as you are. We don't really care why you want what you want, uh, but given what you want and given the options that are available, this is the best match we can find you. Uh, but I, I think there's a lot of really interesting questions in terms of yeah, how those uh, sort of broader market level features <laughs> affect the psychology, which in turn <laughs> feeds back into the market level features. There's some very fun modeling to do there. Uh, it's a good set of questions. Dan, fascinating work, really Thank fascinating. <clears throat> Quick question. I mean, dating sites uh, must be super interested in your work, <laughs> and if we see that, you know, successful matchmaking, 60, 70, one site, even 80%, I take it from your data that is way inflated. But my actual question is a broader question. I, I, I'm just interested, do you think there's merit to think about how technological evolution in form of algorithm may actually blend with uh, human evolution and maybe you know even drive human <laughs> evolution? Uh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Two small, easy questions. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, so the dating site stuff, uh, uh, controversial take maybe, or maybe not, I don't know. Yeah, there's no good evidence I'm aware of that dating sites actually do. <laughs> Uh, much of what they promise they can do, right? In part because uh, it's not in their interest <laughs> to really share accurate data about how they're doing what they do or how they're actually doing. And also, I mean, they have kind of perverse incentives, right? It's, it's not in their interest to actually successfully pair you because then you stop using their service. Um, so really, you know, their, their value is in being a clearinghouse that makes you feel like you're being successful but not necessarily actually being successful. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical that they really know what they're doing better than any of the rest of us. Um, in terms of the, the technological evolution, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. I mean, um, you know, uh, part of who we are is our use of technology, right? So uh, uh, human evolution has been intertwined from, with technical, technological evolution since we you know, first started making stone tools. So uh, I don't think this is a, I don't see this as like a radical departure. This is just uh, a, a continuation of what we've been doing all along. Um, I certainly don't want to think too hard about, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I have no interest in creating the, like a, you know, eugenic, uh, <laughs> ma I, I don't want to be the hand of selection here, I just want to make people happy. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I, 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 anything that is shaping the way that we made is going to have a big impact on, on uh, uh, who we are as a species in the long run. Wonderful talk, Dan. It's Thank always you. so inspiring uh, to see you talk about your research. Um, something that struck me was uh, when you were talking about your data from Ecuador, um, how your model accuracy went up once you learned that there was a mm. prohibition of people dating mm -hmm. across coalitions. Um, and it occurred to me that in the United States, we don't have those like strong prohibitions, but yet there are tendencies for people um, to you know, date or marry people within the same race, ethnicity, religion, et cetera. So I was just wondering, have you um, looked at your US data and considered some of those kind of uh, coalitional drags on people kind of choosing mates that have 
kind of their preferences as far as kindness and intelligence, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'm, I'm partially scooping Katie <laughs> uh, on exactly that point, right? Um, so Katie's been working on that for her dissertation. Yeah, this idea of disqualifiers, right? There are some things that just rule someone out as a partner, right? Like I will not date a Republican ever, right? People say these things all the time. And so Katie was trying to build models that can capture those kinds of uh, sort of hard, those like categorical breakpoints that are different from the more continuous preferences that we, that we measure. What's interesting is, you know, Katie's data has been finding that those sort of hard disqualifiers don't, for the most part, really seem to exist, right, in the US data. So if we look at things like politics, politics race, race, ethnicity, religion, you know, whether or not you're a smoker, uh, whatever, people gladly say, like, yeah, this is a deal breaker for me, right? I will not date a person who has this. But when, then when you look at the models, it's sort of like, eh, I mean, it, it, it does have an effect, but it's more of like a soft preference, correct me if I'm wrong, Katie. Um, so we were like, all right, deal breakers don't exist, right, based on the US data. And then I got that Canombo data, and it was like, here's a hard deal breaker, this coalitional faction that does actually <laughs> improve performance in the model. So now we're just confused. <laughs> uh, so it does seem like some kind of harsh, uh, some kind of hard deal breakers do exist sometimes, um, but they're not always, you know, people don't necessarily have insight into what's actually the deal breaker for them or not. And we don't really have a good worked out understanding of uh, when what is happening. <laughs> yeah. We could probably go on for the rest of the evening <laughs> and there is a reception wa waiting outside, but I want to give the last question to David. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was a fascinating talk and it opened up many, many questions which I'm sure um, you know, were, would be subjects of other studies as well. But I'm curious in that other 50%, you know, that group that doesn't end up in your, your predictive models. And I just wondered, does this give you any insight into um, the fact that people make bad decisions? that they often make the same bad decision in relationships over and over <laughs> again, uh, and that their feelings and desires are not always transparent to themselves. They're not necessarily honest, even if they think they're being honest about <laughs> where they rate themselves or where they rate their, their, their mates. So I'm just curious whether, you know, in the process of doing this, even though it's not your, your primary objective, if you've gained any insight into those types of cases? That's a fantastic question. Uh, I mean, you know, yeah, sort of like I was just saying with these, with these deal breakers, I mean, yeah, part of what these models give us insight to is, yeah, the, the, the ways in which people sometimes don't have self-insight. Uh, and that's sort of a nice feature of these, right? We're not bound just to what people can report about themselves. Uh, we, can, we can see in some ways, uh, ways in which things that people don't necessarily know about themselves. You know, in terms of the, the making bad decisions, I think it's such a fantastic question. I, you know, I, I don't want to be like, you know, I'm happy with how we're doing. I'm not going to be so confident so far to say that like those 50% are definitely making bad decisions, right? These are, these are ridiculously simple models. This is like cocktail napkin stuff we're doing so far. So, you know, it's definitely the case for the majority of those people, we are wrong, right? There's some good reason why they're together and our model is just not capturing what's happening and in, in, in why the people made those choices. But yeah, some of them have to be wrong though, right? Uh, especially if they're not happy. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it has been, uh, I have been thinking about this a lot, right? Like, how can we get at why did you make this, <laughs> this bad choice? Uh, why are you with this person? And I, I've, I've meant for so many, like, we've done so many of these studies, and I've meant for so many times to just throw in, like, one open-ended question that's just like, just, just write, like, why are you with this person, right? Like, <laughs> like what, what happened here, <laughs> right? Because uh, I do think there would be some really great insight. And, I, I, you know, I do have a hunch that a lot of these people are just going to be like, it was circumstance, right? Like, you know, I didn't, <laughs> I, I came from a small town and I met them before we left, or, you know, uh, unexpected pregnancy, or, you know, stuff happens, right? You don't always have total choice over who you're with. Uh, and so I suspect that a lot of these people that we're getting wrong are people that, if they had the choices available that we are giving them, they might have made a different choice, but just the way their life played out, they didn't. Um, but yeah, I don't have those data yet, so that's just the speculation. But I, I, yeah, I think it's, uh, you're right, like this is a really special opportunity to get at both, you know, how people make decisions when it goes well and also how they make bad decisions. I think that's a, a really important other side of the coin. Well, it was clearly not a bad decision to select. <laughs> 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 and let's, let's thank uh, Dan again for a wonderful talk and see you out there. Thank you. Thank you.
see you out there at the